Hi, and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. This week, meat of the plant-based and lab-grown varieties. What's the science behind these meat alternatives? And for the stuff grown in a Petri dish, would you try some? And then what it looks like is kind of a little soupy, sort of gunky blob at the bottom of our tube. And we hear about new research from Indonesia on cigarette advertising and how it lures in children. 74% were within 300 meters from school. I'm Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware in London. You're listening to The Conversation Week, the world explained by experts. Beyond Meat is taking another go at faux chicken. The meat alternative company on Thursday rolled out plant-based chicken tenders at around 400 U.S. The fake meat market is sizzling. Just last week, Beyond Meat announced it would soon release a new chicken tender made from plant-based proteins. So Dan, have you tried any of these plant-based products? I have, actually. I was eating the uh, Beyond Burgers kind of regularly at home for a while. They're pretty good. How about you, Gemma? I haven't tried one of the more recent ones. I did try and eat a burger recently in a pub, but unfortunately it was one of the bean-based ones, not one of these new meat substitutes. But there's a lot riding on all this, isn't there? It's like a lot of people are saying that humanity really does need to switch away from eating so much meat. It's certainly an important part of the environmental discussion, and the ethical concerns of killing animals are pretty obvious. There's also a lot of health benefits from eating less meat, too. However much I may know all that, when I'm presented with the options in front of me, so whether it's a beef burger or a plant-based burger or if I'm in the supermarket aisle and I have to make a choice... It's just really easy to go to the thing that I know and love and tastes really juicy and good. <laughs> so moving to this plant-based diet is it's just really hard for people like me who love meat. Uh, me too. And I totally hear you. And I think the goal of these companies is to make it so that it's not hard to make it so you want to eat their product and it tastes just as good or even better. In this episode, we're going to hear more about how these fake meat products are made, about the science behind what some are calling the next frontier cultured meat grown in a lab. And even the more fundamental question, are people going to eat this stuff at all? Price and concerns about taste and health and nutrition are always things that come up. And so I think for cultured meat or plant-based meat to be competitive on the market, they are going to need to match this price taste convenience thing. It needs to be something that people enjoy eating, that they feel comfortable cooking, that tastes good and is affordable. This is Maddie Wilkes. I'm a postdoctoral research associate at Yale University. Maddie's research focuses on moral psychology. She's interested in why people do or do not behave in ethical ways. And one of the things I'm interested in within that is when there are technologies that allow us to avoid ethical issues, why might we be unwilling to engage with those technologies? As part of this, Maddie has asked people what they think about cultured meat, more commonly known as lab-grown meat. For the average person, they want to make sure that the food is good, it's healthy, it's accessible for them, it's affordable. And then typically ethics, environmental concerns and these factors come on in addition to that. We're going to hear more from Maddie a bit later. But first, let's dig down into the science behind some of these meat substitutes. We're going to start with the plant-based stuff. Companies have been making meat alternatives out of vegetable products for decades. Soy and other bean burgers have been around since the 70s. But in the last few years, a couple companies, including Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods, and specifically the massive funding behind them, have changed the game of meat alternatives. So what we saw with the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger, that was around 2015, their burgers are supposed to look, smell, feel, and taste, and cook exactly like animal meat. This is Mariana Lomas. She's a research associate at the Center for Culinary Innovation at Northern Alberta Institute of Technology in Edmonton, Canada. She works there developing new food products. The important thing here is that they are not targeting vegetarians or vegans. They are targeting everyone. They are targeting meat eaters. And that's why it's so important for the products to taste and feel like meat because they want people who eat meat to buy their products. To make a convincing meat mimic, two of the most important things you need to get right are taste and texture. Texture is very important. And it's really hard to mimic meat's texture because animals, they have muscles. And muscles, they are flexible and they are elastic. And plant cells, 
are very rigid and unbending. So you are working with two very different things. These companies are kind of doing like a reverse engineering nature. They ask like, what makes meat taste and cook like meat? And they go from there. So a big part of what makes meat taste meaty is something called the Maillard reaction. What happens is once you heat meat, sugar and amino acids, they combine and they create thousands of flavor compounds. This is the chemical reaction that happens when you sear a piece of meat. It's the smell of the sizzle. If you're doing like a pot roast, if you sear the meat first, it's going to taste better than if, if you don't. Because then the Maillard reaction is not really happening. But it is a very complex reaction. And scientists to this day, they haven't figured out entirely. Companies bringing new plant-based meats to market employ teams of scientists that work on how to perfect the flavors and textures. And as they find new ways to make better tasting products, they keep on tweaking the ingredients and the manufacturing process and updating the burgers as they go. So what are these building blocks of a plant-based meat product? Well, the first thing you've got to get is some protein, and vegetable protein at that, and popular options include soy or pea proteins. Some companies are trying other proteins derived from rice, fava beans, or chickpeas. After protein comes flavor. Companies don't actually have to disclose their flavoring agents, so it's actually tricky to know what companies are really using here. After flavor comes appearance. Some companies use beet extract or pomegranate powder to get that meaty blood red color. There's also another ingredient used by Impossible Foods in its Impossible Burger called soy leg hemoglobin, or heme for short. It's a kind of fungus and it solves two problems at once. Meat has a kind of like an iron taste, right? Because of the blood cells. So the heme has that taste and also has the color. So the heme not only is working for the flavor, but also giving the burger its red color. And the last and potentially most important ingredient is actually fat. Fat helps with both the flavor and how something feels in your mouth. It creates that richness and the juiciness. You know, like when you bite and then it coats your mouth, and that's fat. Also, the fat activates areas of the brain that are responsible for processing taste and aroma. And I think that's one of the biggest difference between the plant-based meat that we are seeing now and the vegetarian options that we had 10 years ago. There are a couple different options for how to get that fat. One is coconut oil. It's not the best option because it melts faster, which means that when you're eating, that juiciness wears off quickly. So this has led to many other experiments with blends of different oils and other types of plant-based fats. All this mimicry that researchers are using to make a plant-based burger or sausage taste meaty and fatty and just like the real thing, well, that's all processing. And that's caused some scientists and health experts to question just how good for you these products actually are. You cannot just assume because it's plant-based that it's going to be healthy. You have to look at the ingredients because at the end of the day, they are ultra-processed processed foods. Studies looking at other types of ultra-processed food suggest they are associated with obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer, and other chronic diseases. Plant-based meat alternatives, though, are still super new. It's unclear what, if any, health risks will be associated with eating them. But they are for sure not as healthy as a salad. The general public, though, doesn't really seem to care. Plant-based meats are booming. In 2019, the market was estimated to be around 11.1 billion US dollars, and it's forecast to grow to 35.5 billion by just 2027. So plant-based meats are probably here to stay, but they do have a competitor coming up soon, and that's cultured meat. Scientists at NASA began working on the technology to grow meat in the lab in the early 2000s. By 2013, the world's first lab-grown hamburger was presented and actually eaten on TV. Now, the world's first lab-grown cultured beef burger has been cooked and eaten at an event in London. Since then, the science has advanced a lot and costs have come down. 
In late 2020, Singapore became the first country in the world to approve the sale of lab-grown meat. Singapore has given U.S. startup Eat just the go-ahead to sell its lab-grown chicken. There are dozens of startups working to grow what some are calling no-kill meat. It's some seriously cool but very complicated science. So, to find out how it works and where the technology is headed, I called up a good friend of mine, Andrew Stout. I'm a fourth-year PhD student in Dr. David Kaplan's biomedical engineering lab at Tufts University in the Boston, Massachusetts area, and I study cultured meat. Okay, cultured meat. Uh, How does that work? Take me from whatever you start with to whatever you end at. We start with a cell biopsy from an animal of interest. So for us at Tufts, what we do is we go to the Tufts veterinary teaching herd of cattle, and a veterinarian gives us a small biopsy of muscle from one of the cattle. We're talking like the size of a jelly bean. We take that back to the lab. Uh, we digest the tissue. We extract cells that are they're called satellite cells, and they're sort of the native muscle stem cell. The muscles in you, me, or cow all have satellite cells in them. They're kind of sitting in this quiescent state until... They perceive an injury. Taking a small biopsy from a cow will make these satellite cells think it's their time to get to work. And then they will start duplicating. They'll become activated satellite cells is the term. And once they're activated, what they want to do is they want to grow into a bunch more muscle stem cells. And then they want to start fusing together to form muscle fibers. So we take the satellite cells. And we put them into culture flasks. So basically, we put them into petri dishes. Then the cells start to grow. Andrew, or whoever else is growing these things, will give them the nutrients they need to grow and divide, and also signaling factors that give the cells a little message and say, hey, turn into muscle cells, not something else. And in the lab, what we do is we basically continue that process to expand the cells. That's pretty different than what you would see in a production process where you wouldn't be doing things at kind of the flask level, but you'd be working in in bioreactors and expanding the cells and things that look a lot more like brewers, fermenters, or things like that. So these are growing in the Petri dishes. What does this look like? What does it smell like? So in the lab setting, what it looks like are these kind of small plastic flasks. They're full of basically a pink liquid that we feed to the cells. So you can't see them with, with the naked eye, but when you look under a microscope... They look kind of, the terminology is like spindle shaped. And so we'll grow those up and then we'll harvest them from that plastic. And then what it looks like is kind of a little soupy, sort of gunky, whitish blob at the bottom of our tube. And so if you do that a lot, then what you get is you get a really big, whitish, blobish, gunky, (laughs) gunky thing. Okay, okay. The, The kind of color difference there is because, you know, when you think of, meat, you think of this particularly beef, you know, you have this rich red color. And that is largely colored due to the iron in the blood and the iron that's bound to specifically hemoglobin or myoglobin proteins. Andrew explained that there are several different ways to get from this white gunky blob of cells to something that looks a little more tasty. One is that they're seeding the cells onto plant-based scaffolds. Those are three-dimensional structures that the cells stick to differentiate in and you get more of a structured piece of tissue. Another way could be to use these cultured meat cells as an ingredient in something that's primarily plant-based. These cultured cells don't have to be muscle even. They could be fat cells too. Remember what Mariana said earlier. Fat is a big part of the puzzle of how to replicate that ever-elusive meaty texture in a plant-based alternative. Plant-based proteins are pretty good at recapitulating the texture of animal-based proteins. But plant-based fats are really bad at recapitulating the texture and flavor of animal-based fats. And so that's why when you eat plant-based burgers, a lot of time they feel a little greasy in your mouth, or they might shrink a lot, or they might get really dry really easily. And that a lot of that has to do with the interaction between the proteins and the fats. And so there's, I think, some really interesting speculation about uh, cell-based fat being a really, really attractive first target because it's a low percentage of the final product, you know, just mass wise, it's like two to 5%. Um, but it, it's a really important factor from a flavor perspective. It's really the fats and the fatty acids that contribute species specific flavors. 
So when you eat beef versus pork and you compare those, really the big flavor difference is coming from those fats, not the proteins. It's this option using lab-grown meat cells in combination with plant-based proteins that Andrew thinks has the biggest commercial potential, at least in the short term. I think that the immediate future of the field is probably one of hybrid plant-based, cell-based products with varying levels of the percentage mass that's plant versus cells, and also the plants providing maybe a lot of structure, a lot of the bulk of the product, and then cells are hopefully providing valuable function in terms of flavor, in terms of smell, in terms of texture. Making meat alternatives as good as normal meat is certainly a goal. But labs like the one Andrew works in are trying to go a bit farther. Once you're dealing with cells, the whole world opens up to you that isn't open when you're dealing with whole animals. For one of his own research projects, Andrew genetically engineered some cow muscle cells so that they produce nutrients not usually found in beef. And the nutrients specifically are carotenoids. The flagship one is beta carotene. The real motivation for picking those nutrients from a meat perspective is that they're really powerful antioxidants. Lipid oxidation is a chemical change that occurs when you cook red meat. And the end products are associated with a higher risk of colorectal cancer. Antioxidants like beta carotene reduce this oxidation. So if there was more beta carotene in meat, the theory goes that this could reduce the risk of some cancers. The big result was just that we saw a reduction in lipid oxidation when we cooked or stored these cell pellets. This is all untested in people so far, but the process at least works. And the idea is just really cool to try and make cultured meat healthier than real meat by tweaking it in the lab. Andrew's really excited about where this could go and what's possible when you gain the cellular level control over meat. Once you have that cell line, it's potentially sort of like a free benefit, right? Because you're not supplementing or fortifying your food after the fact with ingredients that you need to, you know, source and buy and pay for. You're just like having the cells do it all for you. So there are a lot of different therapeutics that you can envision a cell synthesizing and having this kind of new format for drug delivery, for example. These could be antibiotics or anti-inflammatory drugs, but drugs or nutrients aren't the only option. Other things that I like to think about are, you know, like flavor enhancements. My, my pet project that I always talk about because my PI is never going to let me do it, is to engineer chicken cells to produce limonene, which is like the main volatile and flavor compound in, in lemons. And so you'd have like lemon chicken uh, without <laughs> needing to add lemons. <laughs> For now, though, lemon chicken without the lemons remain a figment of Andrew's imagination and pretty far from his or your plate for that matter. As of now, there are a lot of pretty big production and regulatory hurdles to overcome before lab-grown meat is even available in the U.S., much less widely so. When do you think in the States someone might be able to buy a cultured meat product? Yeah, it's a good question. My canned answer is somewhere between two to a hundred years. That's what I've been saying for a long time. I think a lot of companies are really like champing at the bit to, to sell something. Um, so I think with regulatory approval, which I think you could reasonably expect in the next year or two, a product will be sold in the next year or two. I think the question of will a company sell a product is very different to the question of will a company profit on the sale of a product. That's because the cost of growing meat in a lab, while it's come down a lot in recent years, remains pretty dang high. Remember those cultured chicken nuggets approved in Singapore? They're available at a members-only club for around 17 US dollars as part of a tasting menu. That's $17 for chicken nuggets. Even if the price of such products continues to come down, there's still one big question though. Will anyone eat this stuff? Maddie Wilkes, the moral psychologist we talked to earlier, ran one of the earliest studies looking into this question in the U.S. What we found was that in a nationally representative U.S. sample, that about 30 or so percent of people said that they would eat cultured meat regularly, but about 60 percent, almost two thirds, said that they would be willing to try cultured meat. And so there's certainly not a blanket no out there in the community, but it's also, you know, there's a distinction between people willing to try something and willing to eat something regularly, as you would expect. 
Um, and I know there's been a number of other surveys that have found similar rates. Some surveys have found higher levels of acceptance and some surveys have found lower levels of acceptance. And this depends on who you're asking. At least in the U.S., studies suggest men are more open to eating cultured meat than women and that people on the political left are more open to it than those on the political right. But then you've also seen there's a great study um, where they looked at attitudes of, to cultured and plant-based meat in China, India, and the U.S., and they found even higher rates of acceptance in China and India than they did in the United States. And so there's certainly like a lot of variability, but overall, people's attitudes are, I would say, cautiously optimistic is a, a nice way to think about it. But some people are very against the idea. I do also have work that suggests that some people feel extremely negatively. So in one of my studies, we've asked people, you know, how much do you agree with the statement, cultured meat would be wrong, no matter how small the risk and how great the benefits. And in a couple of samples, we've had around 30% of people agree with that statement, which is very high for such a strongly worded statement. So what are the objections? Well, the first is simply disgust. There's sort of this ick factor response that people have. Then there are more emotional and ethical issues, including the feeling that cultured meat is just unnatural. People have concerns about things like playing God or interfering with nature in ways that we're not supposed to. And my guess is that that's the kind of ethical issues that people who are opposed to cultured meat are citing. And I think a lot of that also probably comes from things like we tend to feel less comfortable with technologies that are more novel. So there's some fantastic research showing that Novel technologies are less accepted than the equivalent technologies that have been around for a long time. This question of naturalness runs really deep. One study in 2018 found that participants were less accepting of the potential health risks associated with cultured meat than of the same exact health risks if they were associated with a traditional meat product. And that was because they saw cultured meat as unnatural. So it shows there's sort of a, a mixture of things like concerns about the novelty, naturalness, disgust, and I think there's probably some sort of unknown and fear associated in there as well. And I think that's all very understandable because this is a new product. But in spite of all this, Maddie thinks cultured meat could be one way to reduce the enormous environmental toll of regular meat consumption. I think traditionally people have been primarily focused on price, taste, and convenience, and we are starting to see this shift towards broader environmental concerns and broader ethical concerns. But I think we're kind of always faced with this dilemma where even if people might want to do the right thing or want to buy the ethical product, ultimately they can only do that if all of these other needs are met. And so one of the reasons I've been such a supporter of cultured meat and like why I think this is something that feels like a good way to address a lot of these issues associated with factory farming is that it doesn't require people to make moral change. Yes, there's a little bit of a change in terms of being willing to eat the cultured meat as opposed to traditionally produced meat, but they're not asking people to give up meat consumption entirely. And I always felt that that was insurmountable and cultured meat offered a way to almost let people skirt around that moral question. This is a really, you know, hot topic. There are animal activists out there who feel opposed to cultured meat because it is still using an animal for production. My personal view is that, you know, if you can provide a way for people to do the right thing without taking on great personal costs and without needing to make moral change, that's probably going to be the fastest way to address the issue if we're thinking about the environmental issues or the suffering of the animals or things like that. And so for me, I think if we can actually allow people to do the thing that they want to do without causing harm, that's the best outcome. If it's too hard to get people to give up meat entirely, cultured meat might be the next best option. I asked Andrew, who spends hours and hours and hours every week growing animal cells in a lab, what he feels about the work he does. Does it weird him out? I'd say it doesn't weird me out. I, I'd say it really pumps me up, honestly. I, I like only find it really interesting and exciting. Um, I understand people who you know are weirded out by it. I think food is such a touchy subject for so many people. Not in a bad way, you know, it's just really close to all of our lives and emotions and identities. But, you know, I think the the counter argument that you always hear to that is you just ask, you know, like, do you really know what, go, what goes on in like large scale intensive agriculture? And that's arguably also extremely unnatural, right? So I think in animal agriculture, the appeal to nature is sort of a weak, weak argument. I appreciate people being a little uneasy about it. But I think also when I talk to people and have more and more conversations with them about it, people who were initially a bit put off seem to view it more sympathetically over time as they kind of like learn about the fact that it really is, you know, like the same biological processes just happening in a different setting. All of this comes back to what Maddie was talking about. 
Even if companies can overcome the hurdles of price, taste, and convenience, they've still got to convince people to eat something that is, for lack of a better word, interesting. These are very new technologies. Maybe they'll never catch on. Or maybe, in a couple years, you'll walk into a supermarket and see a label that says, no animals were harmed in the making of this steak. So Dan, after talking to Andrew, would you eat any of his cultured meat from the lab? Oh yeah, I'm all in. I I like eating weird stuff and I think it'd be great uh, to be able to eat a burger and not feel bad about it a little bit. I think after hearing him, it's kind of on all of us to give it a go, really, isn't it? Yeah, at least give it a try, right? You can find a link to the story that Mariana Lomas wrote for the conversation about meat mimicry, as well as some further reading about plant-based and cultured meat in the show notes. We're taking a quick time out here to tell you about another podcast that you may enjoy. If our meat story made you hungry for a more compelling discussion about the latest scientific breakthroughs, check out a new podcast called New Scientist Weekly. Each week, a panel of journalists from New Scientist and their guests discuss the biggest news in science from the environment, health, technology, or space. I just listened to their latest episode, which is looking back 25 years to the legacy of Dolly the Sheep, that first successfully cloned animal. And it's a fascinating kind of review of what impact that scientific breakthrough had on our understandings of the way cells work. The show is a fun and really informative listen. Search for New Scientist Weekly wherever you get your podcasts or head to newscientist.com slash podcasts. In our second story this week, we're talking about the dangerous effects of cigarette advertising. In many parts of the world, cigarette advertising on TV or on billboards is banned, or at least strictly regulated. But not so much in Indonesia. Smoking is on the rise in Indonesia. The country has the world's largest population of male smokers, and its cigarette industry is expanding. It's ranked in the top 10 countries in the world for the number of adults who smoke. And a couple of recent studies have looked into the links between cigarette advertising and smoking in the country, particularly its effect on children. To find out more, I called up one of the lead researchers, who's based in Semarang City in Java, Indonesia. I am Nur Janna. I'm a senior lecturer in health promotion in the Faculty of Health Sciences, Universitas Dianuswantoro Semarang, Indonesia. So the research you do looks at cigarettes and cigarette advertising. How many people in Indonesia smoke? Among Indonesian adults, 15 years old plus, 33.8% of adults are smokers. Uh, including two-thirds of men are smokers. It means that 63% men adults here are smokers. For women, it's only 4.8%. The prevalence of young smokers 10 until 18 is increased 26% from 72 in 2013 to 9.1 in 2018. So it's the adding of one million smokers in uh, five years. So you're saying two thirds of men and, and a third of all the adults smoke in Indonesia. What, what does this mean for people's health? Tobacco related diseases like cancer and cardiovascular disease have been the biggest causes of death in Indonesia. And it is also because the great number of smokers can affect the number of people who expose the secondhand smoke. So not only a smoker will cut the effect, but also the people around them. So you wanted to find out more about advertising near schools and whether it had an impact on on whether children started to smoke and, and continued to smoke. So tell me what you did, first of all, and in the first study on this. In 2018, we did outdoor tobacco advertising mapping in Semarang City. The advertisement data was collected during November, December 2018. And then we noted the type of advertising like billboard, video board, banners, uh, neon box, posters, stickers. And then we also categorized the advertising into the size, small, uh, medium, and large. And then uh, we also find the location of school. In Semarang, we have about 900 schools. We put the point on the map 
and then overlay with the Q point of Tobacco Advertising that we recorded from a survey. So then you were able to map how close the advertising was to each yes. school? Yes, exactly, yes. Mm. And what did you find? We found a total of 3,453 advertisements. 87% of advertisements were medium in size and 74% were within 300 meters from school. We also found that 45% higher density of advertisement within 100 meters around school compared to 300 meters around school. It means that the closer the school, the denser outdoor tobacco advertising. So this means that the tobacco companies are actually on purpose advertising closer to schools. Is that what you have concluded? Yes, yes, of course, uh, because I think they target the young people to see their advertisements. So you did this mapping survey to find out where the adverts were, but then you also wanted to find out what effect it was having on the children. So what was the second study you did to find that out? We interviewed students in a sample of high school to observe smoking behavior. We randomly selected 20 high school and interviewed 400 male students. We found that youth at school with medium and high density of outdoor tobacco advertising were up to 2.16 times more likely to smoke compared to those with low density. And in the rural area, smoking behavior is higher than in the rich area because usually in the poor area, density of tobacco advertisement is higher. So this means that children in poorer areas are having more advertising and then they're more likely to, to smoke. Yes, of course. Mm. And they also display the tobacco product beside snacks or tools for children. They usually uh, show men with strong uh, and good body and then do extreme action like flying or jumping. So it's not that they're in kind of bright colours, that they're not targeting children in that way. It's just that they're presenting an image that the children see as kind of someone they want to be and something exciting. Yeah, yeah. And other countries have banned cigarette advertising in, in all media, but also particularly near schools. So what is the evidence from elsewhere on, on the impact that that can have? Research now show that banning of tobacco advertising will reduce the smoking prevalence. And I think the another strategy is make the price of a cigarette higher than now by increasing the tax so the children cannot buy the cigarette and then we have to limit the age of buying cigarette. In Indonesia, uh, children can buy cigarette easily in a store. We also found that sometimes parents ask the children to buy a cigarette. So it's also on the culture. So you want to see more tobacco control, less advertising, age limits. What are the challenges to, to making these changes in Indonesia? Are the tobacco companies powerful? Yes. Sometimes they support politicians in the parliament. Sometimes they also support big event or building public area and then they also support students with scholarship. It makes people in Indonesia dependent on tobacco. So what are you going to do next? I do media literacy program for children. We use media literacy program to educate them. I think the program have to target children and policy. We can empower children to think that cigarette is not a regular product, it's a bad product. And for policy, we have to advocate the government to make a policy to uh, ban the advertisement. It's been a pleasure talking to you and thank you for telling me about your research. Thank you very much. We'll post a link to the story that Nojana and her colleagues wrote about their research in Bahasa Indonesia in the show notes. 
To end this week's episode, we've got some recommended reading from Hannah Hogue in Toronto. Hi, I'm Hannah Hogue, and I'm the Deputy Editor and the Energy and Environment Editor at The Conversation in Toronto. My first recommendation is for a story I worked on by Daniel Skerritt at the University of British Columbia. The article is about the decades-long negotiations at the World Trade Organization to curb fishing subsidies. More than $22 billion of government money is spent annually on propping up the fishing sector, and that's led to overfishing. Ending these harmful subsidies could actually increase the amount of fish in the sea and improve the well-being of small-scale fishers. In the article, Daniel takes a close look at the draft agreement that will be negotiated when the talks resume on July 15th, and the possible outcomes. He writes that we may not see all 164 ministers come to an agreement this week, but he's cautiously optimistic. Any agreement will have a positive outcome if it reduces harmful fisheries subsidies. It will give fish stocks time to rebuild for the communities that rely on them most. My second story for you this week is another article about the ocean. This time we go deep underwater and cruise above the seafloor, mapping out its peaks and its valleys. Sean Mullen from Memorial University of Newfoundland writes about the effort that's underway to map 100% of the seafloor. Upgraded maps could improve navigation, but they'll also give us important information about tides, tsunamis, and storm surges. They could help us better understand how ocean currents move heat around the world, which could change the way the ocean takes up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They could help guide decisions on conservation. We actually know more about the contours of Mars than we do about the bottom of our own ocean. For much of the ocean, that resolution is so low that we may be missing entire mountains. That's it for me. Happy reading. Hannah Hogue in Toronto there. That's it for this week. Thank you to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode and to the conversation editors, Luthi Zulfika, Ika Krishmantari and Stephen Khan. And thanks to Alice Mason for our social media promotion. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com, email at podcast at theconversation.com. You can also sign up for our free daily email, which is really good, by clicking the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying The Conversation Weekly, please leave a rating or review where podcast apps allow you to. And please tell your friends and family about the show. Good old word of mouth, especially those who may never have listened to a podcast before. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Our theme music is by Nita Sal. I'm Dan Marino. We'll see you all next week.